Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, past, present, and future. Welcome, and here now, Corey Gomez. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chronicles of Hollywood History, past, present, and future. Today, I am joined by, you may know her from Alligator. I know her primarily from Get a Life. I am joined by the lovely Mrs. Robin Riker. Yes, hello, everyone. <laughs> Well, I have to ask you the first question I ask everybody. How did you get started in the business? Well, um, I came by it honestly. My mother and my father, I'm third generation actor on both sides of my family, actually. My grandmother on my mother's side was an amateur actress. And my uh, grandfather on my father's side was uh, a clown in Ringling Brothers occasionally. And my father was a pro who has... A, quite an IMDb page of his own. He's no longer with us, so he doesn't work as much, you know, being dead, that really slows you down. <laughs> and my and my mother uh, was a professional actor and director and writer, too. Not not that they got me hooked up. I came to Hollywood with a free place to stay and $45 in my pocket, so it wasn't like my, my family paved the way. But I started acting when I was very young on stage, and um, uh, my parents uh, owned a legitimate theater in Aspen, Colorado, and when my mo my folks divorced and mom went back to school to get her master's degree at Boulder, they have a wonderful Shakespeare festival there, so I was doing Shakespeare when I was about 10, did a couple of seasons with that company there, and um, so it just naturally followed. I mean, I've been writing since I was very young, and, and, uh, and acting since I was very young, and so... You know, when it came time to decide that I was going to be a grown-up and pursue my own uh, career, I uh, moved to Hollywood instead of New York. There were choices. I was going to, I thought about New York, but I'd already done so much stage growing up that I wanted to try film and television. So I came to Hollywood with those $45 and a free place to stay. And your first big, big movie was uh, the... I think it played theatrically, but I think a lot of people I know saw it on the ABC Sunday Night at the Movies, um, Alligator. Yes, yes, my I, first feature. I love that movie. I do, too. I, I really did like it. And um, it was a very glamorous debut in the storm drains of L.A. <laughs> um, but it was a great deal of fun, and I got to work with a number of really well-known uh, Actors, you know, the late Robert Forrester, who was a lovely, lovely man, um, was my leading man. And uh, character, actor Michael Gazzo from The Godfather was his boss in the show. And um, lots of character actors that you would recognize if you were a fan of films old and new uh, were my supporting cast. And I was the leading lady. And here's a little tip. Uh, not a tip, but a bit of a fun fact. Brian Cranston was a PA on that show. Oh, from the, the, the from Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston. Yeah, for Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad, and from Malcolm in the Middle. And I didn't know any of that until I did an episode of Malcolm in the Middle with him, and he was gracious enough to tell me that he had a crush on me, and that we, you know, and that uh, he'd been a PA on the show. And that's what I mean about really. Uh, good people, I mentioned this to you off air a little bit about how nice it is to have the stars of shows be real, you know, and remember that they weren't always the star of a show and to treat people well and kindly. And so some, many years after Alligator, I did that, the episode of Malcolm Middle with him and uh, reestablished that sort of connection. And then, um, Several years later, I was going to an Emmy party, and um, Brian was nominated, and our show was nominated, and he recognized me and called me over and had me sit down with his folks and, and told that lovely story about him being a, a production assistant on my first movie. It was just gracious and nice and... So everybody out there listening, be nice to people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no matter how fancy or rich or celebrated you are, you're just a person when it comes down to it, you know? When we had mentioned off air too, all the guest spots you had on like shows like A-Team, Greatest American Hero, Fall Guys, all those, but 
your first big was uh, your first big series was uh, the sh- it was a Showtime series if memory serves uh, probably their first series uh, Brothers. Yes, it was their first series, and um, yeah, that was a fun one. And we ran for four years, five years, and it was on the Paramount lot. And uh, I remember we had the biggest pickup in television history. It may have been. Uh, superseded by now but we did our first seven episodes and there was a big party on the paramount lot there for us and there was cake and champagne and tequila and celebration and everybody was all excited and at the right right in the middle of the party our producer uh made an announcement and he said hey everybody well and we all thought that we were going to wait the usual couple of months until the show started airing to find out you know what our fate was whether we'd get another a few episodes or another season or whatever, we got picked up for a hundred episodes. Jesus. Yeah. Before we'd even started airing. Or maybe it was 50. No, it was a hundred, I think. And, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty great. We, I just flew across that lot on my way back to the car, you know? Oh, so exciting. I remember like, because it's not released on DVD or anything. And my, my most vivid memories of the show, I remember, Philip Charles McKenzie, because he played Donald, he played it very right. buoyant. And I remember Yardley Smith was in a bunch of them, too, because her voice is unmistakable. Yeah. What did she do on that? I Forgive me, I don't recall. Uh, I, I, was I remember in? she was somebody in it. She was very young. I huh. think said her voice. I can't rem- you, you can't, that voice is, not. I mean, not even though she's oh, yeah. Simpson, it's just... Regardless, she won't ever forget her voice. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh, my goodness. I feel a little bad that I don't recall. Um, <laughs> but we did a lot of them, so I hope I'll be forgiven. <laughs> well, I, she, well, I don't think she had a whole run. I just remember her popping up on a handful of them, or quite uh-huh. a few of them, I should say. <laughs> Interesting. So now I want to do some research. <laughs> because I met Yardley also through another friend of mine. Um, years later, a woman named Sharon Ernster. They were friends, and... Uh, and so I, I remember Yardley from there. Now, you said Brian Cranston told you he had a crush on you. Uh, I would be lying if I didn't tell you from 1990 to 1992, I thought you were the hottest woman on television. Oh, and my I God. Get a life. I, I, you know, <laughs> that's what I primarily, that's, I mean, that's my, when I think of you, the first thing I think of is get a life. The Chris Elliott show, you were Sharon Potter. And I don't know, I liked... I don't know. I the character. I mean, I granted you were an evil woman on the show, but it was still sexy in its own way. So yeah, I was totally. And so there was another guy in my school that was like, we were just infatuated with you for years. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's wonderful. That's great, man. It's good that even though that she was a bit of a bitch, you. I mean, she was right. This is what I think is that this is why I get a life is it isn't everyone's cup of tea. You know, they people either think it's hysterical and groundbreaking and great, and then there's a moderate kind of group, and then there are people who go, I don't get it, Chris Elliott. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, what I what I felt about Sharon was that she represented the audience you know all those people were going oh dear god is he really going to do this now Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) so i felt like i was the voice of those people out there who were wondering what the hell was going on with chris's character oh if he was my neighbor i would have beat the hell out of him i mean he was probably (laughs) the most unsympathetic character in history but he was i mean he was funny but i mean we had just watched the episode not that uh, just a day or ago when you had him brainwashed to calling you Miss Sharon and they had to clamp his eyes open clockwork orange style to like, <laughs> right, uh, yeah, right. free him. Who, did he write a lot of that himself? Because, I mean, that was like the weirdest show, but it all kind of worked, but it would only work for him, if that makes sense. Well, he had, I think, I'm sure he, I know we had a lot of input on the show. I don't know how many episodes he wrote, but he had a partner named um, Adam. Oh, my God, what is Adam's last name? Oh, I really Rifkin, like all these people. Rifkin. Yeah, Alan Rifkin. No, no, Adam Oh, crap. I mean, golly. Um, <laughs> uh, what the heck? He was a, a partner of his, and so he knew Adam Chris Resnick. very... That's it, Resnick, yes. And uh, thank you. And, um, yeah, he uh, uh, knew Chris very well. So uh, if Chris didn't write them all uh, or have a hand in every part of it, he 
was written for very well by his longtime friend and partner. Well, the Zoo Animal on Wheel episode was actually ranked number 19 in TV Guide's funniest sitcom episodes of all time a few years back. I remember that one. Um, I know! I was so delighted to, um, to discover that when they, when they, um, first named us so, because, it, again, I know I use this word often, but it's true. It was so much fun to do and so, just so silly. And, uh, you know, the, I keep, every now and then the lyrics do, I'm the lonely wildebeest, <laughs> proud but frail, from my head to my tail. As he's, you know, <laughs> all the other, I'm a giraffe, I'm a giraffe. I mean, it was just so, so silly and fun. It was, you know, and then, were you surprised it got canceled? I kind of was, yeah, I was. Um, but it was, you know, it, it had been... As you said, and I just agreed, you know, people either loved it or didn't get it. Um, but because there was that talk, you know, that it, we weren't sure um, about how fully embraced the show was, um, I wasn't, I was sad that it happened, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, uh, you know, it's show business. You just, there's nothing you can count on for sure. You know, I had friends who were sitting at, the uh, table read for the first episode of their new series that they were just about to start filming after having shot the pilot, and somebody opened up a variety and read that the show that they were just about to re rehearse was canceled. Jesus. I know. I mean, it's just Hollywood. You know, there's no, you can't count on anything, so you enjoy what it is you're doing when you're doing it. You make the most of it. And um, and then when you find out that your show's canceled, you just move on, you know? Why did they write uh, your husband off of it? Do you have any idea, Larry? I I don't know. I think he maybe wanted to go. If I recall, he I think he had an opportunity to go back east to do something or... Uh, something in his life, I think, uh, has had to do with why he left. But I don't think that they asked him to go. I think it was his decision. I was glad he left. I mean, nothing against him or his character, but then it changed your character so much. I mean, and you, you know, the way you kept trying to constantly kill him, and I think you did kill him three <laughs> times. But I, I gave you more of a chance to shine, which I like that better. Because, like I said, I was a huge fan of yours. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. That's true. And, you know, have they released, t uh, you think I'd know this, um, it seems like Get a Life should be out there in a box oh, set. Oh, it is. Of some I have, kind. A, is I it? have okay. a box set. Oh, yeah. Shout oh, God love put you. It out. Okay, good. Who put it out? Shout Factory put it out. It might be out of print by now. It came out a few okay. years back. Okay. God, do you think I'd know more? <laughs> was it fun? Make Did you have fun doing that show or was it kind of weird? No, I had fun doing it. There was a, um, a, there were a couple of, David Merkin was the director on the show for most of them, and uh, we had other wonderful directors come in too. Um, but there was one, he wanted me to put a cigarette out in Chris's eye. Mm -hmm. And um, although uh, they did the, a lot of outrageous things, I did not want to do that. I was quite adamant about it because I knew that, that um, you know, kids watched the show and I know how impressionable kids are about this. And, and um, I really fought him on that. And he was absolutely intractable. It just it pissed me off, quite frankly, that he was being such a dick about it. I believe <laughs> that's the technical term. And... Um, and I don't remember whether I did it or not or whether my protestations made him dial it back or, oh, yes, I ended up putting it out in his hand. So I did prevail. At least, you know, I did something mean, but I didn't blind anyone in the doing of it. I thoroughly enjoyed when he had sex with you in your meat locker that you had in your living room. And, you, and you're picturing the baby in the womb with like the little beard and the balding hair. That, that final cutout scene of that, that was one of the funniest things I ever saw. Yeah, that was really funny. And uh, so what did he say? Say, 
oh, I can't remember, say something sexy. Or, I can't remember what it was, but it was some things give me a rash or something when we're, when we're just having hypothermic delirium and finally uh, succumb to one another's charms. <laughs> Now, do you know if it, if this is true? If they said that if it would have gone into a third season, he would have just become homeless and been like a hobo wandering around. Oh, that rings a bell. Somebody saying that. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, you know, Chris too may have uh, decided that you know he'd done it all. You know, and we didn't really need another season. Although I can't imagine anybody in Hollywood saying they don't want another season. But. Um, and if I had a but, show, you'd have to throw me off the lot. I mean. <laughs> I, yeah, I know what you mean. Well, you went, you did okay, though, because as soon as that ended, you got cast on sh um, shaky ground. I know. And here's a funny little fact. Um, I was going through a divorce when Get a Life was winding down. And uh, my ex-husband was being, uh, here, we'll, we'll use the technical term again, a dick. And um, it was my... Uh, decision for the divorce and he was going to grab on if, if Get a Life got picked up for another season um, he would have demanded all kinds of money and even though we'd been married for like 8 or 9 years and I had made most of the money he was a writer but I had made most of the money and, and, um, and so we had been going through these, this divorce, and I knew that and he was holding out to find out whether or not the the show would get picked up. And we got we did not get picked up on a we found out on a Friday, and by Tuesday, uh, oh no, we it, it would not get picked up. The divorce was final, and then the Tuesday after the divorce was final, I got a new series, and it was Shaky Ground. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the universe was protecting me. Well, if he was married to you, especially when you were Sharon Potter, he's probably the dumbest guy in the world for getting a divorce. So, well, it was my choice. Oh, so, okay. uh, so yeah. So, uh, well, that's sweet. <laughs> Hopefully, he didn't have to like run around and call you Miss Sharon and all that because that was very, very uh, no. I was easy to live with, according to me. I'm sure he has a completely different take on it, especially now. But, uh, but no, I didn't make him do that. I I remember when you did Thunder Alley. Um, Oh, yeah. And the only reason I remember Thunder Alley is because Jim Beaver was on it, and I'm a huge yep. Supernatural fan, and he had that long, oh, yeah. long run on that show. So Yes. And then Deadwood, after after our, uh, after um, after Thunder Alley, he also had a long run on that HBO series, Deadwood. I have never seen a single episode of that. I'm not a Western fan. I have never seen a single episode. I, everybody tells me how good it is, but I've never watched it. Yeah, it was good. It was good. I enjoyed it a lot. And watching Jim do well, and he's remained a friend, so that's nice. You know what I watched religiously though was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh yeah, I was a big oh fan yeah of that show, and and I I, I recognize I popped right away. I'm not even joking when you uh, when you showed up as the the girl's mom in the witch episode. I think that was like the second or third episode. Um, it was early, yeah. I remember when I saw you, I popped because I was I, I probably you know at the time you know I was probably like hey, they're sharing or whatever like that. You know, so <laughs> right, I have this like, yeah. horrid habit of not calling people by their real names. Like when I see them on TV, I always reference them to another television show. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> no, it's actually really st stupid, but I've gotten better about it over the years. <laughs> oh, well, good, thank good. If it's a bad habit, you can change. I encourage it. <laughs> Was Buffy fun? To, now, did, would you have ever imagined that doing that episode of Buffy, that it would go on to become the big pop, pop culture phenomenon that it, it, it is? No. And I had, I have a playing card in them. Now I'm one of the, in the deck of Buffy playing cards, I'm one. <laughs> Catherine Madison, the witch. Um, and uh, no, I didn't know, but it was really fun. And, you know, during the audition for it, my early Shakespearean training really served me well, and I don't know, but when, when I change back to my real persona as opposed to being, a, you know, taking on the, I, that was one thing that was really fun about doing the show, is I got to play two wildly different characters in the same body. I was, you know, the teenager, mm -hmm. and, and then became the witch, and, um, so my, it was very Shakespearean, actually. 
it was really kind of cool. And I remember that when I, uh, uh, the audition process was very, very cool. I was standing there in the middle of the room being the teenager. And then there, I say something like, you, you little brat. <laughs> and I, and I got down on the, in front of the coffee table, kind of on my knees and looked across at the people. Is that what I was reading with? And did it in my, you know, my best Shakespearean sort of full character of, of uh, an evil person. And that was, that was, that was great. I like, I liked being able to play the duality of those characters, which is one of the reasons why I really like this movie I've got out now on Lifetime. And it's on YouTube too, my husband tells me. Um, called Psycho Granny, because I got to, uh, it's, as a friend of mine said, it's basically the Robin Riker show, um, and because I got to play wildly one person, but I got to be as sweet and as lovely as you would think a, a person could be, and then, you know, just kill you. <laughs> so, it reminded me of what I saw you. that reminded me of the stepfather, only with a lady. Oh, yes. Where you were trying yes. to find the perfect family. Right. Oh, right. I I did not see the stepfather, but I did uh, hear about it. The original and, was and, very and good. Don't watch the. No, remake. was it? Yeah, don't watch the who, remake. Watch the original. Who Who was in the original? Oh, what's his name? He was. Who was in, it wasn't he, Dylan McDermott. What, who no, was it? No, the no. Uh, the remake was the guy from Nip Tuck. The original was. Oh, what's his name? He was on. Um, he was on Lost. He had that run on there. Um, um, crap! It came out in eighty. Um, he was also Call him by another character's name. <laughs> Terry O'Quinn. Terry O'Quinn. Terry O'Quinn. Oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah, okay. I'll, if I watch it, I will watch for the original. Yes, I would recommend it. Now, one thing I, I'm curious about, um, just to go back a, a, a step, you did the, the episode of Buffy. Was David Boreanaz in the episode you did? Because I know you worked with him again on the episode of Bones years later. Yes, he was in it. I don't... Yes, he was. He came. Oh no, no, wait! That was the Englishman who came with Buffy to my yeah, house when was, I was the I teenager. Was the, yeah, I could remember if right. Boreanaz was in the episode you were in or not. I, for some reason, I don't think he was. But it's been a while since I've watched those. Perhaps not. But it was. It was fun to. Uh, and my husband, who's a cameraman, did a bunch of episodes of Buffy, too, I think. Um, but he wasn't on the one that I did, because we were, as you say, it was very early in the run of the series. And um, so, but to work later on on Bones with with, uh, with Boreanaz was nice. He was, he was good to work with. Yes, my wife loves David Boreanaz in every sense of the word. <laughs> now, well, she could do worse. Uh, well, it's, uh, she did. Um, no, she did not. I refuse to believe that. <laughs> you know what? What you did do a spot on? You did a spot on one of my favorite shows of all time. What? VIP. Oh yes. Yes, I was oh one of the God. many men that that couldn't oh, wait yeah. to watch VIP. Oh yeah, that was really interesting. You know something? When that show, I remember uh, uh, Pamela Anderson's mother came to the set and I looked at her mother and well that's where she gets that body because her mother was this little perfectly shaped uh not as pretty as Pamela but um but she had a great little figure you know and um so it was, it was she was lucky genetics play a part in so many things that happened to us <laughs> Well, you know, because I've, I've I've heard mixed. You you can break the tie if you don't mind me asking. Okay. What was she like on set? I've heard that she's a sweetheart, and I've heard she was horrible. So, um, I would I would put it right in the middle. She didn't, you know, like um, there are stars of shows that have impressed me as charming and nice and human, and others who have I thought were pretty foul and she was neither of those she was pleasant and and that's what i remember is that she was pleasant and you know hi and welcome to the set and and that sort of thing and um i haven't any anything negative to say so i, I fear i've not helped you with no, your no, survey I'd, I'd rather, I, I, I like to hear nice things i don't like to hear bad things about people it's, it's depressing yeah, especially when they're people yeah. you like. Like, like I said, I religiously watched VIP. I mean, I was a I was a Pam Anderson fan. I mean, 
What, what guy my age wasn't a Pam Anderson Ex- fan? Oh, exactly. You know, my grandfather was a fan of hers, and he was a big <laughs> fan of that film she did with Tommy Lee. But you know, I don't want to get into that. But uh, oh yeah, he, uh, how come you only did the, how come you only did the one episode of that? You would have been great on that show. I don't know. These are the mysteries of Hollywood. You <laughs> never know. You know, you get well. Here, here's one. I did a. You remember the show? Um, Just shoot me. Yes. Okay, so I go in to do an audition on that show, and it's to play uh, the, I believe it was the ex-wife of George Siegel, and I kicked ass in the audition. They were very impressed. They let me know right away that they really liked it. I got a call practically before I got back to my car that I got the job, and then I show up on the set, and I'd already done several series by this time, and... and um, I'm at the table read, and I'm, uh, you know, before you, that's what they call the thing you do. I know you know this, but you sit down and read the script before the first day of rehearsal, and then you get put it on its feet. And so I'm at the table read for that, and we're going through it, and I go, this character is not going to last. This does not, it it's, uh, takes up too much time. It doesn't, there's no real payoff for here. And and by the time I left the table read and that day's rehearsal on my way to my car, I found out I was not going to be going back. <laughs> but I was, but they didn't want to, um, well, they had to pay me because I was hired and I showed up for work. So they had me, they asked me if I would do the voiceover of two phone calls that George receives in the, you know, in the course of the television show. And I, sure, okay, you're going to pay me, I'll, I'll earn my money. And um, so I did the voiceover for those, and those weren't in the show either. They got somebody else to do it again. <laughs> so you have to be able to roll with the punches out here, you know? You know, you did an episode of Two Guys, a Girl, in a Pizza Place. Yes. This, this is another one of those weird questions. I wasn't a fan of the show. I have no shame admitting that. Although yeah, yeah. I, much like my son, uh, big Deadpool fans, you know, we, my wife is a big Ryan Reynolds fan in general. Did you ever figure Ryan Reynolds back then would go on to be like people's sexiest man in the world and make all these big hit films? Well, he was pretty sexy and very nice, and nice goes a long way to sexing you, making you sexy in my mind, you know. And, but I, I did not. Yes. Short answer, yes. Because I could tell when I was talking to him that he was real, he was grounded, he was one of the guys on the show, unlike the rest of the cast, quite frankly, who, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, who was, who knew that he had a good thing, he was happy to have it, he wasn't bitching about, you know, well, our time slot or oh, this or oh, that, listen, you Jack, you've got a job, you know, and you've got a series and do your work. But he, I knew there was something special about him. I remember sitting talking with him for quite some time on the set, and I knew in my bones that there was something really special about this guy. So I was delighted to see his career take off. He deserved it. He's one of the ones um, that I think, you know, like you, I, I want that, the people that I, whose work I admire to be good people, too. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, so I, I wasn't surprised. In a in a way, I did know that he would. He had it. I knew he had what it took, and that he was, and he was humble about it and appreciative. You know. Anytime my wife gets overly crazy with him, I show her pictures of the Canadian soap opera he was on when he was like thirteen years old. Where and? He had like uh, buck teeth that were gapped in the center and just <laughs> looked like a total. Well, everybody looks like a nerd when they're thirteen or fourteen. But <laughs> right. it was like, there's your sexiest man right there, baby. Before, you, know, okay. you know, we're all. Uh, you know, yeah. like I said, my son and I are comic book fans, so of course we like all this stuff in Deadpool. We think that's oh great, yeah. So yeah, and, and that show. I'm surprised because of that success. That show hasn't gotten a big release, but it's kind of weird how TV shows some don't even get DVD releases; they go straight to streaming. I know, and you know, this is one thing that surprises me about my first series, the one that had, you know, we did 110 or 20 episodes of it, um, Brothers. It, it's, there's no box set, there's no streaming, there's and, nothing. you know, even though it was, um, you know, we broke a lot of ground. I mean, we dealt with the AIDS issue before anybody was really talking about it. We had openly gay characters on the show. We dealt with infidelity and death and we did it in a funny way. And we, and 
it's, but now it's like Saturday morning cartoons for the kids. And mm -hmm. um, it's, I'm just astonished. I've, over the years, I've called a couple of times saying, what's going on with this? And with all of the platforms now that we have that need product and content, you would think that 110 episodes of a really good award-winning show would be uh, welcome. But I think whoever wrote it, Christopher, not Christopher Lloyd, Christopher, anyway, somebody doesn't want to give up the rights, and I have no idea why. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. But I am not the one who calls the shots. I mean, you think Showtime would try to buy it? I mean, they, they put out DVDs and Blu-rays of Shameless, Nurse Jackie, you know, all right. the other shows get uh, pl plenty of releases. I don't, uh, you know, HBO would have had that on 10 platforms, Blu-ray, DVD, 4K. HBO oh, knows how to market their stuff. <laughs> I know it. I know it. And it was a good, it was really a good show and it was groundbreaking. All, you know, in the gay bars in Hollywood, everything came to a stop on Tuesday nights when we were airing it. You know, people in every gay bar, all the TVs were tuned to it and, and, um, it, it, it really it made a difference in people's lives. We got letters from people all the time saying, you know, my brother came out and my father just couldn't take it and it was terrible. And then we started watching this show together and now they're friends again, you know. I mean, it changed people's lives. I mean, that, that's the best thing that you can ask for any kind of, uh, any kind of art, you know, that it affects people in a good way or in a way that changes them, I think. You, had a, you have an impressive television run. I mean, I, I, I enjoyed you as Sue on Reba, you know, the, the yeah. his friend's mom. Uh, Reba was a great show. Um, yeah. That's another sh Now, I own all those. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those people that likes to buy sitcoms because I'd rather watch a DVD than, than stream. But, uh, you know, that's another one that I have the set of. And that was, you know, a really good show. That's another one I was surprised uh, got canceled um, when it did. Right. Yeah, me too. I don't know why that happened. Um, and, uh, but it was, that was a, a really fun show to do. And Reba was one of those people that was, you know, gracious and generous and sharing. And, and, um, and it was a great set to work on as well as fun stuff to do, you know. You also had a nice long run in uh, soap opera land as well. Yeah, oh, that's a funny story. I had never, uh, you know, theater snob that I am, I had never cared necessarily to go out for any soap operas or do any of that. And um, so I never pursued them. And I was doing a, a stage play out here at the Pasadena Playhouse. And um, the run was over and I was in Palm Springs with my husband who was on another kind of shoot. Uh, and um, my phone rang, it was my manager calling, saying that the casting director from Days of Our Lives, I think it was, had seen me in the play and wanted to know if I would be interested in doing a role on Days of Our Lives. And I, and it pretty much, and it was going to be an offer, and my philosophy is as long as what they're offering me doesn't involve something embarrassing with farm animals that I wouldn't want my <laughs> mother to see, I, uh, I would accept offers, you know. And so I, she told me that it was an offer and would I be interested, but my soap opera snobbery kind of was going, well, I don't know, is it something interesting? Is it like a homeless woman who lives under a bridge? And there was a pause on the other end of the phone, and she said, it's a homeless woman who lives under a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in to do a couple of episodes of Days of Our Lives, and um, and it was it kind of confirmed part of my concern about soap operas. I, I worked with several of the younger characters on the show primarily, and it kind of was like. And soap opera fans out there, please don't be mad at me, but this was my experience. It was pretty much, you know, if you don't knock over the furniture and what you say sounded kind of like English and what the writers meant, okay, cut, print, we're moving on. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, you know, they were nice people to work with, and I did my bit, and then I kind of went, well, you know. And that may have had something to do with the youth of the people I was working with, too. I'm sure the pros on the show weren't that way. But um, anyway, so then time passes, and um, I'm in the, I've, I've, I can't remember. I did a play here with Tony Danza 
at Gary Marshall's theater and um, finish the play. And I had such a good time. It, uh, stage is my is my soul food. You know that's what I really love because you get to tell the story from beginning to end, and you experience the ride with the audience, and that really is so rewarding to me. And um, and uh, you know my roots. Um, so uh, I said to my husband, I came to L.A. because I wanted to pursue film and television all those years ago, and now I really feel if. I don't get to go to New York and try that, then I would I would be not going because I know you wouldn't want me to go, and that doesn't bode well for a creative relationship with somebody. And he said, if you feel you need to go, you go. And so I found, as the universe often does for me, thank goodness, I found a, a room in a beautiful apartment. Uh, uh, on the Upper West Side, I uh, told my agents in LA to tell their New York branch that I was coming, and um, I arrived on a Tuesday, and I had a job on a Friday, an uh, off-Broadway show, and um, so I'm li- so I would just show runs and we do our thing, and you know my picture is outside of Sardis and all of these wonderful experiences and. Um, and so now the show's over, and I'm going to my first Yankees game at the old Yankee Stadium. It's going to be one of the last, ga- not one of the last, but one of the last kind of few years of that, of that stadium. And um, so I am taking a picture of the ball field to send to my husband back in L.A., and um, my phone rings, and it's my agent saying that they are interested in me for this role, uh, a fairly important role on, um, you know, what the hell is the show? Um, do you have it? It's Bold and the Beautiful. Bold and Beautiful. Bold and the Beautiful, yeah. And so, again, it was that I was not, I was really digging being in New York, and um, I was, I said to them, you know, if they want to make this an offer, then um, I'm in. Um, but I'm not going to fly back to New York, I mean, to L.A. on my own dime to audition, you know. Mm-hmm. And But if they want to offer it to me, um, let them know that I would be interested. So a few minutes later, the phone rings, and I have to leave my seat again, and I go into the ladies' room at Yankee Stadium because it's the only quiet place. And they said, the, the producer's going to call you in a minute. He got, he, these weren't their words, but... You know, he doesn't want to hire a pig in a poke. He wants to at least have a conversation with you before before uh, giving you the offer. So I'm in there. I'm in the stall in the ladies' room. Again, total glamour. And um, uh, the phone rings. It's a producer. We have uh, a, we start to talk. And what had been this quiet little office space, as it were, for me, suddenly it's the seventh inning stretch. And everybody is, the bathroom is, you know, towel ripping, toilet flushing, extravaganza of sound <laughs> as I'm trying to have this conversation. But um, it was successful. He said, all right, uh, you'll be hearing it from me. And the next day, they offered me the role, and, um, and I flew back to L.A. and did that for a while. Do you prefer doing normal television or soap opera television? <laughs> I prefer normal <laughs> because it, although my the stage training really helps you with uh, with soap operas too because you have to you have to know your lines completely and there's not a lot of cutting and starting over again you know unless someone knocks over a piece of furniture or breaks out into Swahili um, <laughs> they you know they you have to get it done right so there are a lot of times when you would be amazed at how many you're in the living room of the fancy people's home and watching the drama evolving between the family members and behind what you don't know is behind the sofa cushion is their script and so at any point they have to you know, whip it out to look at what because you have to learn a lot you know uh in a sh- fairly short period of time so there is a skill definitely a skill involved in doing in doing the soap opera my first experience was not the truest of the experiences because i then went on to do oh yeah i got another oh no oh. and i did it a run on general hospital too mm-hmm. and that was fun that was another uh kind of miracle, miraculous manifestation for me the uh <clears throat> excuse me i had uh it was pilot season out here 
when they used to still have one. And um, uh, I was meditating. I'd gotten into a lot of meditation. I was meditating that I was going to get a pilot. I was going to the show. It was our tw our twentieth wedding anniversary. My husband and I, and um, the husband that stuck. And um, <laughs> it was our twentieth wedding anniversary, and we were planning a trip to Italy for a month. And um, so my meditation was that I'd get a job, I'd you know shoot the pilot before we left, and we'd go on our trip, and then we'd find out that the show was picked up, and I'd get to work when I came home. And the last line of the meditation was, "Now release your." imaging to the universe and uh, let it happen in a way that's right for you. So pilot season comes and goes. I don't even get an audition for a pilot, okay? And then, just as we're about to go away on our, on our, I call it the honeymoon, but it was our anniversary, <laughs> um, I got this call from General Hospital. And I said again to my agent, you know, if they can turn it, if they're willing to offer it to me, I'll, I'll do it for sure, but I was not going to cancel my trip, and so they, they offered it to me, the, the, um, I did like three episodes or something, and, um, and then, so I, I went off to Italy for a month, and we're in Florence the night before, we're about to come home, and my agent calls again, and they want me for like 17 more episodes, so... It didn't happen the way I imagined it, but it happened in the way that was right for me, and it was just what I'd asked for in essence, you know. I shot the few episodes before I left. That would have the equivalent of shooting the pilot. And then they, just as I was coming back home, they offered me more more episodes so I could go to work when we got back. So it was pretty pretty wonderful. What was it like being on an episode of Hung? Oh, <laughs> I like uh, that. You know, I actually really like that show. I did too. I did too. And there's another. Are you ready for another funny story? I am. Um, I am. Uh, so I'm going back to Ohio, where my husband is from, and we're going back. His mother, uh, his birth, her birthday is in May, and Mother's Day was in May, and we were going to be there, and we were going to celebrate with them. And I am literally bending down to pick up my. A suitcase off of the, uh, of the, you know, luggage conveyor belt in Dayton, Ohio, and my phone rings, and it's my agent, and there's an audition for me, and the show starts in four days, and what do I think? And I went, oh my God, this is just perfect. Everybody out there listening, if you ever, if you're wanting something to happen for you, just make non-refundable reservations anywhere <laughs> you know and it will come through it's just this strange you know physics of, of desire and uh, realization um anyway so they sent me the script my mother-in-law did not have a fax machine at the time so i you know, I just wrote everything by hand in the scene. Just, it took place in the, the audition scene took place in the cab of a truck. And so we were on a tree line, in, and the show took place in Michigan, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we're in Ohio. And so we're on a, and my mother's, my mother-in-law's boyfriend just pulls up in this beautiful new truck of his. And so I sit in the driver's seat. Um, Evan films me from the passenger, Evan is my husband. He films me from the passenger seat as my, as Lou, my mother-in-law's boyfriend, holds the script in front of Evan so he can cue me and, and send out the thing and damn if I didn't get the job. And I had to leave like three days later or two days later. And it was, it was fun. The, the, uh, uh, the, 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 um, character in the episode didn't play out as it was written completely. You know, it, the part got smaller. Um, by the time I got back for it, but uh, and but I enjoyed working on the show. I love working; it's fun, you know. I mean, it's. Uh, I think I overuse the word fun, but it is. <laughs> no, that was a good show. I liked. I've always yeah. liked Thomas Jane. I've always thought he was a good actor. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. And um, who else was it? One of the Arquette girls was she? Did she play? On that show, uh, if if she did, it was a guest spot here or there. Oh, okay. Okay, um, but yeah, it was uh, I, it was a show I had liked and I w had been watching, so I was jazzed to be, you know, cast in it. It's always nice when something you enjoy watching brings you on board. 
You know, I rented a movie in 93, and I only rented it because you were in it. What? Um, and it was called Step Monster with Alan oh, Thicke yes. and uh, Corey Feldman, who was at the height of probably drug abuse at the time of that film uh-huh. came out. So, but yes, I rented that because you were in it. Yeah. Oh, how nice. That's very nice. That was really another, you know, great span of personas to play in that character, you know, because it, really she's just this giant alien lizard. And, um, but she takes on human form one month of a year so she can mate. And, um, and so it was, it was, you know, I had to play the nice, person when the kid's around or when the husband's around because he's the one I have chosen as my mate and um but the kid knows who I am and so there is that whole you know dichotomy of characterizations to play and the, the more you give an actor to do the the more fun it is what was uh Fellman like on set back then that was when he was pretty bad off I remember he, yeah you know he was fine I didn't have a lot to do with him. Uh, he was there on set when I was there, but I don't think I had much to do with him. And um, he, uh, but I could see that he was kind of in a bad way. Oh yeah, it's, it, now when we go back and, and watch some of his films, I mean, by his own accord, he'll admit, yeah, yeah, I was high in this movie, hey, I was high in this movie. And you can, you can watch him and realize you're watching a coked up performance, you know, which is... Uh, I don't know. I guess it's a testament to how good an actor he is because he was able to pull everything off. Yeah, and kept getting hired. You know, this was, I don't, this was, Step Monster was not during this era, but there was a, you know, right around the time of Alligator and for about 10 tw- years more, cocaine was part of people's uh, deal. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, it was just everywhere. And, um, and I tried it, and I liked it, but I was one of those annoying people who could make a gram of coke last a month because I just I have a pretty high energy anyway, and I just liked one little toot just to get me going, you know, I, for, for going out for the evening or whatever it was. I love so the I, way it smelled. I have no shame in admitting that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a diplomat. <laughs> And uh, yeah, but it was it was crazy. So a lot more was tolerated um, back then because there were more people doing the same damn thing. Yeah, and there's no shame in that if you can handle your business. That's uh, right. You know. I, I remember the last day I ever did any. I was doing another play, a show called Ladies' Room, here in L.A., and we ended up taking it to San Francisco. And, you know, you do your show, and you're all wound up, and you go out for cocktails after, and then you come home, and um, and you're not quite out, unwound and ready to go to sleep yet. So that's when I became intimate with Showtime at the Apollo, which always came on at, like, 1 or 12.30 <laughs> or something. And then one night after the... Um, uh, Showtime, there was a documentary called The Princes of Cocaine, and it talked about, it, it was an undercover operation where a French camera crew secreted cameras in their bags and their on their persons and interviewed growers and, and uh, members of the government and uh, people who prepared the coke. And when I saw how it was made, I thought, I said, oh no. That's okay. I know for your nasal passage is the shortest route to your brain, which is the most important organ in your body. And um, I thought, nope, I'm not going to put kerosene and acetone in that area anymore. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> so that was good for me. <laughs> you know, before I ask you a, 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 a modern question, I, I just want to flash back real fast. One of your first TV spots was, and we mentioned this uh, off air, uh, as a sexy nurse in Welcome Back, Cotter. Uh huh. Um, another, I, I guess, another. Would you have guessed it? Question: uh, John Travolta. Would you have ever thought he'd go on to become well, John Travolta? Basically. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't have. I knew that Welcome Back, Cotter was a big hit, and I know that hits often propel even those unworthy <laughs> into more, <laughs> you know, fame. Not that I'm saying he was unworthy, but I, th- this was also at the height of his uh, uh, entitlement. Oh, yeah. You know, my, I got my, have my own chef and I have to have this and I have to have that. And that does not fly with me ever with anyone. 
And um, I don't care. I, no one has ever had anything that I wanted so much that I would compromise my integrity to get it. Mm-hmm. And and um, and he was just a pill, and his reputation was that of a pill. And um, so I didn't. I knew that it was likely because he was in a hit show, and he was a of the right, you know, was attractive guy of that age that this might turn into something more but my first impression was not oh here's a star it was no Ryan Reynolds moment for me there mm-hmm. at all yeah because he had he had the big string of hits because um and I had interviewed Lawrence Hilton Jacobs because I was a Welcome Back Cotter fan I was a very oh, big yeah. fan of it and yeah you know I I, I mean Sometimes the dumb, I mean, Travolt, they were all dumb, but um, yeah. Travolta was the dumbest of the group, I think. But yeah, I mean, he had that, uh, the movie he was in that I really liked was Blowout, was a De Palma film. But um, he had that string of hits, then he went away, and then Pulp Fiction brought him back. I mean, right. his credit, he's able to keep coming back every so yes. and right when he fades out he manages to get something to shoot him back so right that, and there's a, that's a talent right there too and the people who represent you and and you know yeah it's well good for him you know i don't begrudge anybody their success unless they're and we shall for the third time use the charming word unless they're a dick you know i mean i just sometimes that i don't like to see people who are unkind and and uh not really all that talented get elevated over people who are more talented and also people, you know, when humans. Are you, when are you going to be in the Tarantino film? I don't know. But he he was a big fan of Robert Forster. He relaunched oh, Robert's yeah. career. And I know, and he was, he, he was a fan of mine. But, um, you know, Quentin, give me a call. I'll show up. <laughs> you know, I, I doubt he's listening, but if he is, you know, I, I, I would recommend you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Corey. I appreciate uh, it. He's, he's, he's my second favorite director. I make no shame in admitting that. He's only made a couple films I didn't care for, but uh, I think you'd be awesome in one of his films. Who's your first favorite director? Robert Rodriguez. Oh, yeah. And I think it's because I've never seen a Rodriguez film that I dislike. Tarantino, I've seen. I didn't really like. I hated Death Proof. I, I didn't really like Hateful Eight. And I'm, I'm the one guy that's yeah. not an Inglorious Bastards fan. Right, right. So, whereas Rodriguez's movies, I mean, they're all shocky movies, of course, but I liked all of them. So, I have to go with Robert Rodriguez, his favorite. Yes, character. you do. Go with your heart. I, that's right. <laughs> I have to go with him. He's, uh, uh, I'll see a movie just because he directed it. Who doesn't love Machete? Come on. I know. I know. That was great. I did enjoy that. Now, you've written a book. I have. Yes. And it kind of is right up the the same alley as the uh, Hollywood Chronicles. Um, in that, it's about, it's called A Survivor's Guide to Hollywood, How to Play the Game Without Losing Your Soul. And it, uh, I've gotten some wonderful reviews from it. And it's um, all about, my husband is invited back to his alma mater to, to teach a master's thesis, uh, directors of photography, or to work with them on their thesis films. And he said, throw in another ticket, my wife will talk to the, you know, the theater department, and I thought, well, what am I going to share with these kids who have just been steeped in theater history and all the stuff and acting technique and everything? I said, oh, I could share with them what it really is like to live the life of an artist and how it's, you know, you it's everybody's happy when they're doing something and working and getting acknowledgement and getting paid. It's the times between that you need to, where you need to find your strength and your, and your joy and, um, not wait for other people to to make you happy, you know? And uh, so I've gotten, as I said, some wonderful reviews. Ed Asner gave me a fabulous review. The late John Polito gave a great review. Theater directors from around here have given them, and, um, and uh, actors you would recognize have given quotes and, and nice reviews. But interestingly enough, um, some of my favorite reviews are the ones that warm my heart the most come from people who aren't in the business at all because it isn't really a strict i'm not teaching you how to act i'm suggesting ways you might want to consider behaving you know mm-hmm. what i mean yeah um that uh and people who are, are in businesses altogether different than show business have said oh these were some great tips and uh, you know about the way to look at things and and how to approach life in general and celebrate things you know i think that you have to we 
especially now in this time of COVID when everybody is feeling so, um, you, you know, I can't even put it defeated. into words. But it, 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 defeated, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, and contained and, and limited, you know. We, we have to find reasons to celebrate. And they don't always have to be a big job or a big paycheck or anything like that. It can be that, wow, this recipe I just tried came out great. Let's crack a bottle of wine, you know? <laughs> or, or, hey, I've organized the sock drawer. I deserve that on the back. Yeah. You know, we, and, and little things like finding your luck and seeing, uh, noticing lucky things because they do, I am a testament just by some of the stories I've mentioned that lucky things happen if you if you look for the luck and 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 acknowledge lucky things when they do happen like you you know the old saying find a penny pick it up all day long you'll have good luck mm -hmm. have you heard that yeah, yeah it never worked well, for me but yeah I... well dig this if you notice it if you see a penny someone said to me that if it's heads up you pick it up um and uh that's the good luck part but uh, so now, when I walk down the street, if I see a penny and it's heads up, I pick it up and I count that as something. That's that's a sign of something positive. You know, it's a penny, but it's a sign that a good thing happened. And if it's not heads up, I bend down and turn it over so it's heads up for the next person. Ah. And um, I, I, they're little things, but they are things that we that we have the opportunity to exercise in our own lives every day. For instance, the, you know, there's a gentleman, older gentleman, who waits for the bus on a corner near where I live, and he's always dressed nicely. You know, he's got a fedora hat and a nice jacket, and, and, and I looked over at him one day and noticed how dapper he looked, and I rolled down the window and I said, you look wonderful, sir. And the light on his face was so... Uh, wonderful. So I got the benefit of having made someone happy, and he got the benefit of being made happy. And no matter what you do in the world, you know, especially if you are in the arts, you may not, you don't have to wait for somebody to give you a role. You always have a role in the world. Why not, you know, make Mrs. Motzkowitz happy at the deli and tell her <laughs> she had, looks lovely today? You know, it's amazing. How coming out of ourselves and and focusing on someone else, even for a moment, even how dapper do you look, sir? You know, for a moment enriches everybody involved. Where can we buy your book? Do you now? I know you can get it on Amazon, but now are you doing the cool gimmick where you can be bought directly from like you, where you autograph it? Yeah, baby. <laughs> so you go to robinriker dot com. And that's my, uh, you know, my my website, and um, and you can order it there. That's where I recommend everybody buy buy it from, because you you want the autograph. Yeah, that that, and I love doing it. And I and it's, yeah, I think that it's and it's also it's funny, and um, and it's it's an, it's. People have enjoyed it a lot. So anybody out there who wants, I'd love to share it with you. Yeah, Patrick Kilpatrick autographed his to my wife. That was a rip oh. off there, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> the, the cover of his book creeps me out, so I, I never bothered to read it. I couldn't get past the weird cover. <laughs> I don't think I've seen the cover. Maybe I should look it up. Uh, he's naked underneath a blanket. Ah, Okay. And <laughs> yeah, I wasn't doing it for me there. I'm glad he made it out to my wife. Um, no, I'm just that's kidding. Great. Patrick Kilpatrick's a very nice guy. Um, now I recommend. Now, do you sell? Do you do the other thing? Do you sell autographs and stuff like that? Yeah, there's a. Uh, I someone invited me to join that. Uh, do you call it a website? I don't know. Cameo. Cameo. Where I was you, just going to ask you, you about that. Oh yeah. So I. Uh, that was very recent that I was invited to join that, and um, and so I've actually made a couple of them, and I love doing that. I really love doing that, and um, you know, I sleep with a cameraman, so it's going to look good. <laughs> and um, and then um, uh, and there's another one, some autograph site that uh, Zobe. No, let me see if I can. There's so many of them out there now. Uh, are there a lot of them? Oh, my my son has had me buy him probably three grand worth of Zobe autographs from people over the years. 
you're a good father. Well, he's an autograph collector, and there's, you know, not a lot of conventions here, and, you know, he's only 11, so where is it really going to fall right. out to a lot of things? So, yes, he's he's established a, quite the collection of autographs. Oh, well, that's great. Who are some of his faves? He's a horror movie fan, so he, you know, oh. Kevin Potter, uh, C.J. Graham, um... Oh my God, Kelly Maroney, Barbara Crampton, you know, he has all the, all those horror people, you know, uh, a lot of wrestlers that he, he likes, he's uh, gotten their autographs, so yeah, oh, he's a nice. big collector of that, in fact, his bedroom is basically just wall-to-wall -wall framed autographs. Oh, that's great. Okay, I found the website, it's called Autographs to You, Autographs to You at gmail.com. Do you have any get a life ones? No. <sighs> Do I have any pictures? You mean any pictures yeah, like from pictures get a life? From get a life. Yeah, I'd buy a get a life autograph picture from you. You know, I'm, I you know I should go into the archives <laughs> and see <laughs> see yeah. what I have there. And, and now, then and then oh go ahead. Oh no no you first please. I was just going to do sh sh shameless self promotion again. Um, uh, I have, did I say, mentioned Psycho Granny already? You did. Okay. And then there's another show that is streaming right now on a platform called uh, called Pure Flicks. And um, it's called Mood Swings. And so it's an eight-episode series. And um, it's kind of like a modern-day Golden Girls. And... Um, and I play Coco, a New York divorcee who's come out to try to find a man. And um, so it's fun. It's funny. And, and uh, Donna Mills is in it, and Diane Cannon is in an episode, and even Eric Roberts in drag is in one of the episodes. Uh, Eric Roberts so. is in I, I got to interview Eric Roberts. That's oh. a that's a cool dude. I there's all I, I have to to say that I talked to him when he was on a, a a set with him and his wife, and he's a cool guy. I like him. Good. I he, he I wasn't working the day that he was working, but. Uh, he was very much game. Oh, he! Lo I think he says he's on a set. He does sometimes 10, 12 things at once. He, he's on a set almost every day, six days a week. He's, uh, yeah, he's he's always busy. A very, very, very nice man. Very nice man. Good. Oh, that's another good one to hear. Thanks, Corey. Like I said, I like <laughs> the people I admire to have good reputations as people. He, the fact he didn't get an Oscar nod for uh, um, Star 80 is, is, is a tragedy. Oh. Right? Uh, yes, yeah, so I got to see Star 80 when I was a little kid. My grandfather felt the need to show it to me when I was, I don't know, seven. But I, I don't know if that scarred me or if it was what. But uh, I know. Uh, I got a Star 80 story. Okay. Um, one of my early episodes uh, oh, was on uh, Sh Fantasy Island. Okay? Oh, great show. I remember that. And there was this, and um, I talk about this story in my book, too. Um, so there was... Uh, the star of the show was James Darren, I think, and there were a retinue of beauties around him, and I was one of them, and this beautiful blonde girl was one as well, and um, and I liked her right away, as she looked like a goddess, and very sweet, and we're walking to lunch one day on the set, and she starts telling me about, she has the same agent I do, who used to rep Playboy models, you know, and... Um, and she has the same agent, and um, we're talking, and she's telling me about how she got here, and that it was her husband from Canada who sent her naked pictures, you know, to come to L.A. And um, and as soon as she started talking about him, I got this creepy, creepy feeling. It, and I wanted to say, be careful, watch out, there is danger here. But I just met her, and of course I'm not going to say that about her husband, <laughs> but I now I kind of wish I had, because Jump got to about, you know, maybe a year later, and I decided to go back, not the same trip to New York, but another trip to New York to push a play that I have. And um, and I'm, uh, you know, and oh, just before I went to New York, she gets the role in the Bogdanovich movie, I think. Uh, they all laughed or something. And, um, and I, I'm walking with my agent to another audition, and he tells me about it, and I'm thinking to my, I was so jealous, Corey. I was just consumed with jealousy. Here I am, a classically trained actress, and yes, she's got beautiful tits, but honestly, you know, how is she just waltzing into a major film? Mm -hmm. And um, 
and oh, I was just livid. And um, I didn't let it show, but it, the truth was that. And I, and so I go back to New York a, a, about a week later. I'm walking down the street, and I, you know, I see some what I perceived to be some New Jersey beauty queen has met a terrible fate. I get back to the, my dad's house. I call my agent just to check in. They say, oh, we're so terrible. We're so cons uh, upset about Dorothy. And I'm thinking, I put on my, you know, my boy that's like, I give a damn mm -hmm. voice and go, oh, really? Why? And they say, didn't you read? She was murdered by her husband. Mm -hmm. And that experience, I even have chills right now as I say it to you. That experience taught me so much nobody gets your job no matter what position what business you're in you get your jobs if you didn't get your job it wasn't your job and i was so if you didn't get that job it wasn't your job and i was so ashamed of myself Corey, for begrudging her for one moment the success and the joy that she undoubtedly felt when she landed that part and as her life began to take off and her husband saw the gravy train leaving the station and he couldn't stand it. And he, and I was just, I never ever felt that way again. I never did. I was so devastated by her being murdered, especially following my selfish reaction to her success. Well, that's human but, nature though. I know, but still it was a pretty, I'm glad I got that lesson early because you can't go around, you know, and a lot of actors do. A lot of creative people do go around going, that, you should, that she doesn't deserve it, or I should have, and what did they? No. They got it as their job. Mm -hmm. You know? So anyway, it, uh, that was a big lesson for me. So that's my star rating thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, we already established you have the website. Very, right. Uh, I know you're on Twitter because I follow you on Twitter. Oh, nice. And you're on Instagram. Yes. I'm just really learning that one. Me I too. I just that. started it a few weeks ago. I, I, I think I have nine followers. I'm not I'm not setting oh, the world on fire on Instagram. I don't neither am I. I don't even know. I have something I want to post because I just did a, a sort of an anniversary um, uh, interview about Alligator. And... Um, I, I can't figure out how to get it on the damn thing. And so my IT guy, a.k.a. my husband, is going to show me. <laughs> so. and I know you're on Facebook, but you don't have a fan page on Facebook. You're just actually on Facebook. Yeah, I, I thought I had a fan page. Maybe uh, you do have a fan page. I actually sent you a friend request after I've, because uh, you are you have two mutual friends of, of mine. You popped up in my feed once. It was like, you may know Robin Riker's. I wish I knew Robin Riker. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I know some people she does. So I sent you a friend request. Did I answer you? No, I but that's okay. I don't. You don't know We're, me. we're <laughs> friends. I declare now. We are friends. <laughs> um. So I, I again I'm I'm not uh, I don't I'm paying a lot more attention to Twitter now because I can post you know things and and I I pretty much have that one down and Instagram I'm I just posted something a couple of days ago we were out in the desert and I saw this absolutely beautiful little metal elephant yeah that been, I yeah. think I liked that picture. Oh, good. Okay. I follow you on Instagram. I follow you on Twitter. Yep, here you are. I, if, fans, if you want, and it's at Robin underscore Riker on Twitter. Yay! Yep, I follow Thank you on you. there. And I am on Instagram, and I think it's just my name. I don't... I can tell it? you, because I can look, because I follow you on there. On Instagram, everyone, she is, as soon as it loads for me. You're an angel. Thank you. <laughs> it is... Real Robin Riker, all one word. Oh. oh, yeah. Okay. You want to be my agent? You're really good. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I'd love to do that. Um, now, your agent's pretty cool. He 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 actually passed uh, my information on to you, so I'm grateful Absolutely. for that. Absolutely. Yes. I, I'm, I'm always confident a lot of people that, that you send it to, the reason you don't get the interview is because the agent or publicist never passes the information along. Oh, so, yeah. That can know, happen. Yours sure. is number one in my book. Yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. No, you have a he's picture a here guy. I really love, but I won't say it on the air. I'll tell you when I stop. Um, okay. But no, you have a uh, Yes, I follow you on Instagram. I'm one of your followers. Yay! So I follow you on Instagram, I follow you on Twitter, and I requested you on Facebook. All right. I'm going right there, and I'm going to say yes. 
Uh, you, you can't miss me. I'm a guy with a big leather hat and a beard. I look like a, I look like I should be in a '60s biker movie. Uh, <laughs> there's a publicity shot I did for the press release for the show. So I, oh, that's great. Okay. Uh, ironically, I actually thought I looked nice in it, so I just keep it now. So is that good? So that is on Facebook, yes? Yeah, I'm an interesting guy. I post pictures of my dogs and stuff like that. So you know, fascinating. Uh, yeah, I'm just a fascinating guy, I guess, when it comes to being boring. But um, no, so we, <laughs> we we can follow you on Twitter. We can follow you on Instagram. We can go to robinriker.com. We've got the book we can order on robinriker.com. That's where I say you get it because then you get it autographed. Everybody should have autographed books. My book collection is completely autographed. That's where everyone. That's should get excellent. Them from. Good for you. Good for you. And books, what a concept. I like to read, not as, unfortunately, not as much as I used to. You know, I have a kid in that, but, uh, you know, I used to, I used to read quite frequently. Now I, I still read comic books. I guess that counts. Yeah. Yeah. That does anything you hold in your hand, as far as I'm concerned, to read. I, I like the feel of that. I have s books all around me at, uh, at our home. I just love the way they look. See me you know, too. I like my wife reads on her phone or her Kindle, and that I want that actual book with the slip cover in my hand. I, just like when it comes man. to movies, I want that DVD and that Blu-ray. I don't want to just click a button on the remote. I I want that physical media in my hand. I agree, one hundred percent. I guess that makes us old-fashioned, isn't it? Funny having a DVD is old-fashioned. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know. I even catch myself sometimes to be like, as my wife be like, "Can you get that DVD? I've got it on four K. What do you mean DVD like that?" But, yeah, it's because uh, I threw away all the VHS years ago, but there's still people out there that collect those. So I know I have some, not that I've collected, but just uh, you know, from brothers and from other shows that I've done back in the day. I have them up in the attic if they have if they haven't melted in the California <laughs> weather. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I really do. This was a real big honor for me because, like I said, I was, uh, I mean, I'm all, all kidding aside, I was madly in love with you from uh, 90 to 92 there. So um, Yay. This, was a, well, this was an honor for me. I'm very glad we could rekindle our romance. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Corey, for thinking of me and for being such a lovely interviewer and uh and for including me in your your show. Oh, it was a pleasure. I hope I hope you can come back on again one day. Anytime. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. You have been listening to the Chronicles of Hollywood History. Thank you from Gomez Richmond Productions. <laughs>